here. We're looking forward to telling you about the IS program and hopefully welcoming all of you to our program um, uh, through the spring and into next fall. Uh, my name is Eric Owens and I'm the director of the IS program and I'm a, a professor in the theology department as well. And um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what the major is about and what the program is about. So the minor also, but some of the other things we do as part of the IS program. And I'm really pleased to be joined by the associate director of the program, Professor Nakazato, who hopefully will be up at the top of your screen there. Um, professor Nakazato is, is a professor in the political science department as well. And he is also the director of undergraduate studies for us. And um, so he's a really important person in uh, all of our majors and minors academic lives here uh, at the program. And we'll also be joined by several of our peer advisors, uh, one of whom, uh, Mariana Ferrara, uh, is, should be at the top of your screen as well. And some of the others uh, will be joining us as well in a few minutes when they get out of class. These are juniors and seniors in our program who offer their uh, you know, advice and help in all sorts of things from applying to the program to, hey, Brianna, there you are. Um, uh, where is where is Brianna? Can you say hi, Brianna? Hi everyone, I'm Brianna. I'm here. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I'm going to make you a co-host. That way, you'll appear uh, you'll appear at the top as well, Brianna. And some of our other co uh, some of our other um, peer advisors will be joining us as well. We'll we'll so I'm going to talk a little bit about the contours of the program, and then I'll ask uh, if uh, each of the uh, if Professor Nakazato wants to add anything, he may want to just wait till Q&A uh, and we'll have the peer advisors each introduce themselves uh, and your concentrations and where you're from, et cetera. And then we'll open up to questions. So we'll make sure we have uh, lots of time for questions as well. Um, I'm going to share my uh, screen now to show a PowerPoint and uh, let's make sure that everybody can, can see it okay. Uh, everybody see that PowerPoint okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, move my things out of the way here. All right, so um, there we go. All right, so let's start by talking about the, um, about the IS program uh, as a whole. We talk about the IS program as having four uh, big kind of keyword uh, things about it that help define us in relation to other programs here. Number one, it's very flexible. Um, number two, it's rigorous. Number three, it's interdisciplinary. And number four, it's global. And there are a lot of ways in which each of those terms come to life in our program. And I think we'll, uh, I'll illustrate that along the way and we can circle back to these uh, as, as we need. Um, so a little snapshot view of what the uh, IS program is about size wise. We're about 25 years old now in terms of being a major at Boston College. It started as an independent study and is now uh, obviously a full-fledged major and a minor. The major launched in 2001. And since the beginning, we've had uh, a limit on the number of uh, majors who can join us uh, in order to guarantee a certain size of discussion groups and a certain intimacy of the program. Uh, those numbers were you know, in the 15, 20 range for years, and then they've been climbing and climbing. Uh, uh, into now, uh, over the past few years, we've admitted 105 students each year. Uh, that's uh, divisible by 15, which is the size of discussion group we'd like to have. And um, all of those students join us um, after applying uh, early in freshman spring. We admit people uh, a month later before you register for the fall, and then you come join us. So as a result, we have a maximum of 105 majors each year. Some choose to transfer out of BC or some move into different majors along the way. So there's a modest bit of attrition. At present right now, over the course of three years, we have about 270 majors um, and, um, and uh, about 120 minors as well. There's no admission process for the minor as we'll be talking about. So that's completely open. Um, and, um, and you see last year that our students are diverse. Uh, they tend to be high achieving. And um, we tend to have a, a bit more people apply than we can accept, uh, but that number varies uh, each year according to, uh, to how many there are. Um, let's see. So um, an IS major or minor we think is a great complement to other majors and minors. So while many of our majors are only IS majors, uh, many more are uh, also engaged with other traditional departments across other undergraduate programs at BC 
or area studies programs or other interdisciplinary programs like global public health or environmental studies, Islamic Civ, et cetera. Um, so joining the IS program is not, um, uh, it doesn't untether you from other parts of the university, whether it's more specific departmental and disciplinary majors or whether it's interdisciplinary majors. Um, the major itself, to say a few words about, uh, about this, has five main pathways, uh, through, or has one pathway with five main steps uh, through the process. One is you do core classes for the IS major, which are distinct from, uh, sometimes related to, but distinct from the BC core that you've heard of as a freshman. Second of all, you'll pick one of our four concentrations, which I'll talk about in a second, um, within the major. You learn a language or two, you study abroad, and you complete a senior research uh, project of some sort, whether it's a research seminar or a senior thesis. And we'll walk through each of these in turn. So this is a list of our seven international studies core courses for our major. Uh, in the fall semester of your sophomore year, all of our majors take a pair of classes called Where on Earth? One class is on global history and one class is on political geography. Um, and this is a class where all of the students are in the same class, 105 students, and then broken up into discussion groups and geography labs and things like that into smaller groups as well. The second semester of your sophomore year, all of our majors are split into three sections of intro to international relations. Um, that's taught by Professor Krauss and Professor Erickson. Um, and, um, and then again, you break up into 15 person discussion groups uh, for those classes. Uh, then the other core courses, principles of econ, another 2000 level elective course and a comparative politics course you can take um, whenever you like, although the econ classes need to go in sequence. Uh, and then the seventh uh, and final core class that's required is ethics, religion and international politics. And that's a course that I teach. And we generally want people to take it after they've come back from studying abroad. Um, so the concentrations uh, include, uh, you pick one of the four concentrations, our four uh, areas of study within the International Studies Program are cooperation and conflict, ethics and social justice, global cultures, political economy, and development studies. And these are, um, each of them have interdisciplinary um, uh, elements to them by design. So you're joining an interdisciplinary major, and each of those will have different ways of approaching these same topics. You might want to focus on something like migration, or international trade, or um, or uh, uh, environmental justice, or uh, war and peace. And in each one of those topics, you can study in these different concentrations. So you'll work with a peer advisor and your academic advisor to figure out which of these sound best. Um, you begin your concentration by taking two foundation classes, one that relates to theories of the concentration and one relates to methods. And then you take four electives within that. So this is, what, this is the area in which you see the most um, flexibility within our major, is how people go about uh, moving through your concentration. We have many options for both the foundation one and foundation two classes, but there are about 400 approved classes for our electives from across the university. So there's a wide range of choices there. Um, and, uh, and then there's a language requirement. It's important to note that the IS language requirement is uh, a year additional to that uh, in, in general, to that of the Morrissey College, uh, which, which requires you to have intermediate level proficiency. In the IS major, you need to have advanced proficiency in one modern language that's not English. Um, and, or you can have inter intermediate level proficiency in two languages. So if you studied French and you got, uh, a, a, I think what, a four on the AP exam, uh, then you'd be considered to have intermediate proficiency and you could take two years of Spanish and qualify that. Um, there are some exceptions to these rules where more credits are granted at Boston College for taking Arabic and Mandarin, for example, um, and we'll work with you and go through details if you need to. But the general framework is that we have a higher language standard than the, than the Morrissey College and CSOM and LSOE as well. Um, the fourth big component of the International Studies Program is study abroad. Um, in typical cycle, this doesn't relate to this academic year, of course, but in a typical cycle, uh, about 90% of our majors end up having studied abroad for a summer, a semester, or a full year. This is nearly twice the Boston College average, and it's one of the hallmarks of our program. It's not required of all of our majors. The remaining 10% 
have good reasons for not studying abroad. Sometimes uh, it's because you're an athlete uh, that can't leave during the school year. Sometimes it relates to work commitments or family commitments. Um, we try to make financial commitments uh, uh, as little of the problem as possible by working with the Office of International Programs around scholarships and fellowships and things like that. Uh, but there are always reasons, uh, good reasons that some of our students don't study abroad. Nevertheless, we absolutely embrace it and, um, and do everything we can to help you find the right study abroad placement. Two of the classes you take while you're abroad for a semester can apply toward our electives. And um, there's ton of, tons of opportunities, both in the summer and uh, across the academic year. Uh, Professor Nakazato is teaching a course in Parma, Italy uh, this coming summer on food, power, and politics. Professor Huang from our uh, department, from our program, is teaching a course in Seoul, Korea. Um, I've taught a course in South Africa. Our, our faculty routinely teach summer courses abroad, but you're welcome to take other approved uh, summer classes uh, abroad as well. There are other things that happen while you're abroad as well. Um, two years in, in 2019, we kicked off our first International Studies Summit which is a weekend retreat for IS majors in Europe. And um, they, people met in, uh, in this beautiful place in England and spent the weekend reflecting on what the study abroad experience has meant to them and what they want it to be in the remaining time that they had. Of course, in spring 2020, that got canceled. We had another one planned. Um, and uh, uh, spring 2021 now has been canceled. So we're hoping to revive it uh, in spring 2022, uh, if we can. Uh, but there are also internship opportunities and other opportunities that we help you find while you're abroad uh, to learn, travel, study, research, et cetera. And the final big uh, component of our major is a research seminar or a research thesis. And that comes in the, in the form of one seminar your senior year, those are some of the examples, or uh, writing a year long senior thesis. And I can respond to any questions you have about that. But uh, about a third of our students currently are writing uh, senior theses and two thirds take senior seminars for that. Uh, to, re to satisfy that requirement. So the application process um, begins by doing info sessions like now, and we'll do another one of these in January. Our terrific peer advisors like Mariana and Brianna and uh, their others uh, spend a lot of time talking to prospective students and we'll put a link in the chat as to uh, where you find the list of peer advisors to contact. They're happy to set up appointments with you to talk about the application. Uh, the timeline is that uh, in November after Thanksgiving or early December, we'll post the application at our website. It's not a secret application with trick questions or anything. It's very, it's quite simple actually. And you can download last year's application. Uh, it simply has two short essay questions and then uh, a series of questions about your interest in the program and you attach your transcript. These applications are due uh, February 1st of 2021. And then we announce our decisions by the end of the month so that when March registration comes around for the fall, you'll know that you'll be an IS major or not. If you're interested in the minor, then you can start taking classes that would apply for our minor and you just declare yourself to be a minor. Uh, and info about that is on our website as well. Um, so when you write the application, you'll, you'll give us a sense of what track you wanna be in, the concentration. Uh, you write a short essay and personal essay and uh, give us access to your transcript. Uh, a little word about the minor. So uh, the path here is a little different, but, but uh, in most ways, very similar to the major. You'll take two foundation courses and four electives. So it's a lot like a concentration in the, within the major. You learn a language at the intermediate level and the total is six classes. So here the, here's an example of the foundation one courses that you would take as an IS minor. And then uh, foundation two, you pick from a longer list. And then you pick the same exact, one of the same exact concentrations as the majors uh, do. Uh, the intermediate proficiency level uh, uh, is, uh, is one of essentially two years if you start from zero. Um, all of our students are accepted into the minor and you can declare any time before junior year. So the big comparison is the major has, has uh, it, around 14 classes or 45 credits. Um, it, uh, as opposed to 18 uh, credits and six classes for the minor. It involves uh, these five components instead of this, the two components there on the right, and the language uh, is higher, language uh, requirements are higher. All right, uh, so where can the IS program take you or where can I international studies take you? First of all, it takes you across disciplines. Um, our faculty that are part of our program, we have uh, nearly 30 faculty affiliated with the IS program and they're trained in many different disciplines. They teach in eight different departments and we frequently have other instructors offer classes uh, for our program. I've already mentioned that 
uh, something close to 400 classes are approved as electives in our program. So you'll get a multidisciplinary approach and you can be able to take classes across six of BC schools uh, uh, to select majors for your program. This is a hallmark of our program and it's something that our students really have come to love. Um, courses from the new Schiller Institute on, on integrated science and society will start coming online next year. Um, and we integrate well with all sorts of other programs. So international studies can also take you into a very wide range of careers. And this is a common conversation we have with, with students all, all throughout. Um, our graduates work in government and finance. They work for NGOs and other advocacy groups. They work in education, higher ed, educational tech. They work in policy think tanks. They look at international law firms and local and national law firms. They work in healthcare and biotech, technology, service organizations, and, and much more. And our graduates go on to all sorts of graduate programs as well public policy, public health, international affairs, business law, education, medicine, social work, and more. These are real examples of companies that recent graduates in the past 10 years or less have, have gone into. And uh, you can see that it reflects the, the diversity of our program and the flexibility of your course of study. International studies can also take you around the world. We've already talked about study abroad opportunities uh, while you're a student here at Boston College. But after you graduate from Boston College, you can also, uh, your international studies major can also take you all around the world. We have had a very high number of Fulbright award winners from our program. Uh, sometimes um, at Boston College, over a third of the people who are, who are selected uh, to move on to the final rounds of, uh, from Boston College in, into the Fulbright program are from the IS major. So out of 10,000 students at Boston College, a third of them come out of one program uh, on many different years. And that's a pretty astonishing testament to how great our students are and how focused they are on doing, uh, doing study and teaching and, and uh, work abroad. Our graduates um, tend to receive uh, postgraduate fellowships like Fulbright awards at up to four times the rate of other Boston College graduates. That's based on a six year rolling average that we did, that we did um, two years ago. Um, they do a year of more of service uh, around the world or here in, in the United States at two and a half times the rate of other BC graduates. Our graduates frequently live or work abroad after graduation. Uh, last year, we had a sort of high point uh, that I've seen where om almost a quarter, 24% of our graduates who, who graduated the year before lived abroad and or worked abroad in the year after graduation. So, um, and our graduates have worked at all over. <clears throat> so it truly is, a major that can take you all over the world. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> the last thing I'll mention before I turn it over to our, um, to, our uh, to Professor Nakazato and the peer advisors um, is that our program is much bigger than just the major and the minor. Although of course that's the heart of it. Uh, we also do all sorts of things uh, that are outside of the classroom. We have started a new pro project this year that's just getting spun up called Global Conversations. And uh, maybe Mariana can put a link to that in the, uh, in the chat for you all. Um, we invite every one of you to be a part of that program. It's a new um, opportunity for students at Boston College to have uh, informal one hour conversations with a small group of university students from other parts of the world on one of six major themes that we're talking about. Um, so we'll be spinning up dozens, if not hundreds of these conversations over the course of the year. And it's an opportunity to have a intercultural conversation, uh, whether it's about social movements or racial justice or environmental justice or your experience during COVID-19 as students, et cetera. We have all sorts of uh, themes that come up and we invite you to be a participant in that. We have a project called the Global Citizenships Project that brings amazing people uh, to campus or through Zoom to meet with small groups of uh, our students to think about careers in as a um, documentary uh, filmmaker or as a healthcare professional who does global medicine or as a um, as a uh, as a human rights advocate, etc. And these are closely engaged um, conversations where you ask tons of questions and we spend a few hours together. We also do lectures, of course, and all sorts of other academic events. The Global Engagement Portal, you'll see a picture here that has a gold shipping container next to it. Um, for the past three years, we've had this gold shipping container converted into a video studio and had really powerful conversations with people in refugee camps and in 
um, city centers and in universities and other parts of the world as well. Um, and I mentioned the summit retreat down there. We have other sorts of webinars people are all are involved with. And the, uh, the Global Dynamics of Anti-Blackness uh, project that we have down there is a, is a reading list that we started this summer that we continue to expand on and will be part of the university's larger project to address questions of racial justice. And in our, in our case, we'll be asking all sorts of questions over the course of this year of, uh, of our faculty and our students um, around uh, race and racial justice issues. These are just some of the big projects that the IS program uh, works with. So um, I wanna uh, cut off of there and uh, open up to our, uh, to uh, Professor Nakazato first. Would you like to say something, Professor Nakazato, or you wanna wait till the questions come up? Uh, you know, I, can, I think I can wait. It, it was a good presentation. It's being recorded. It's all good. Okay. Um, we'll come back then. Um, our peer advisors then, why don't you guys jump in and say hi, introduce yourselves a bit, and then we'll turn to questions. Um, Mariana, you're in my top left grid, so why don't you start? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, I'll start off by saying it's so exciting to see so many faces here interested in the IS program. Um, and that I really hope that you guys are going to take advantage and like learn and definitely reach out if you have questions. Um, but yeah, I'll speak a little about myself. So I'm Mariana and I'm a senior. I'm a peer advisor in the IS program and um, my concentration is in ethics and social justice. I'm very interested in questions of refugees, migration. Um, I talk a lot about social justice, environmental justice, um, and I basically <laughs> am very interested in everything international studies, which is why it's such a great fit for me, um, and also a reason why I'm a peer advisor. And yeah, um, I guess I can stop there. I don't know if you want me to give more, but um, yeah, I'm happy. Let's wait, let's wait till Q&A because we'll probably have you guys answer a lot of the questions that come up from students. Okay, um, sounds great. Brianna. That's terrific. Thank Thanks. Yeah, Brianna, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm going to echo exactly what Mariana just said. I'm so excited to see your faces, and I really hope that you guys consider applying to international studies. Of course, it's already in your mind because you're here, but I highly encourage it. Um, I'm also a senior, and I am majoring in the international studies with the PEDS concentration, that's political and economic development studies. Um, I lean more towards development studies because I'm not too great with numbers. So you can really like, uh, the beauty of international studies is its flexibility. Um, and so you can really build your major around what interests you. And so I would say that my major interests fall in racial justice um, and, and social justice more generally domestically, but then I would expand that um, when you take an international lens to African studies and peace building and security studies. So um, you can find a lot of that and ethical appeal, um, ethical perspectives, as well as um, international theory. Um, but yeah, that's generally me. And I can explain more on that in Q&A if you're interested. Thanks so much, Brianna. Great to have you. Um, we also have two other of our peer advisors here. Uh, Grace, where are you? Grace Kavanaugh. Right here. There you are. Can hey. see me? Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, just echoing everything Mariana and Brianna said. It's so great to see all of you. Um, I'm also a senior IS major with a concentration in cooperation and conflict. Um, and I was really attracted to the IS major freshman year because it gives you the opportunity to take so many different classes and so many different subjects. I've been able to take classes in history, political science, sociology, econ departments. Um, so it's really given me an outlet to sort of pursue all my interests. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions. Really excited to see you all. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Mary is here today too. Mary, can you say a word? Hi, everyone. My name is Mary, and I am also in the ethics and social justice concentration in the international studies major. And uh, I'm really excited to be here today and see every single one of you interested in majoring IES. And uh, my interest in particular is also about migration refugees and also particularly human rights, um, as well as say memorials and um, saying forced disappearances that was happening in Latin America. And uh, I am also here to help anything one of you with any questions you've asked. Um, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Great. And Mary, I don't know if you mentioned uh, Mary's an international student also, um, and we always have uh, a strong presence of international students in our uh, in our major and our minor as well. And so um, 
our peer advisors have all sorts of experience around what that's like and and uh, how to help fold you into the into the major and into our community. Um, I think that Mahima and Pearson, our other two Grace advisors, our other two advisors, um, have class right now. So um, let's open up for questions. Uh, we'd love to hear what's on your mind, what you're interested in, um, what we can help you decide, and um, how we can point you in the right place. Feel free to use the hand thing if it's available to you uh, on um, on the uh, on the Zoom thing. I'm not sure if it's properly set up for that, or you can just jump in and unmute yourself. Yeah, Saya. Um, I was just wondering, for freshman students who have already completed the majority of their core, do you have any recommendations scheduling-wise for next semester, considering obviously there's no guarantee that we'll be in the major, but just concentration-wise? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's a common question that we get, and, and it's a good one. Uh, Professor Nakazato, why don't you take that? Uh, generally speaking, we encourage students to have a backup major. Quite often, you've come to BC undeclared, which is fine. Or, you know, you're thinking maybe sociology, maybe political science. It's worthwhile testing the waters. You can also then check to see if there's any IS usable courses in that sociology major or the history major. And so there's sort of ways of, of planning um, for the best, but having a fallback plan. And your problem is you said, well, I've kind of done most of the core, which is still fine. So you're thinking, you know, I would like to be an ethics and social justice major. The classes in theology interest me. You can then take maybe an upper level theology class that again, pushes your interests. Some are IS usable, some aren't, but there are ways to do this. And again, we do have advisors that can sort of walk you through, oh, this is a good course, that's a good class and what have you. And again, you are taking 40 courses over the four years here. And a major is usually a quarter to a third of that. And so you're not defined by your major. So take classes that interest you. That's really what's important to me. And you know, as long as you can sort of express that in your application, I really wanna be an IS major, here's what I bring to the table. And it could be lots of things. You speak multiple languages, you've traveled, or the courses you've taken, all of these sort of define you. Um, and there's no sort of winning magic bullets that gets you into the program. That's the good thing. Um, so yeah, I would, I would encourage you to uh, use the second semester to explore different departments and different programs. And, and that's probably the best advice I can offer anybody. Yeah, we'd love to see, um, you know, of course, uh, for people who are applying, we'd love to see an interest in international and comparative uh, courses. Um, so if there are areas of the world that you'd like to study more, uh, you know, there are all kinds of terrific classes on, you know, African politics or Latin American human rights or whatever. Um, those are always great to see. But as Professor Nakazato said, we don't require any particular class to have been taken before we admit people into the major. We want to see um, that you're capable of uh, flourishing in rigorous courses. Um, so, uh, but that doesn't, they need to be related to the kinds of courses we would offer. So if you had a tough opening semester and did a terrible, uh, had a terrible uh, time of organic chemistry, that really has no bearing on what you're going to do in our major. We have uh, plenty of people who who start off, you know, taking some really intense um, natural science courses uh, that that can be and they decide that it's not for them or they don't do well. Those are not things that we worry too much about. We look we look at the fact we do look at GPA, of course, um, but we also when the GPA is lower than we might expect, we look to see where it comes from. And uh, frequently they're from, a you know, organic chemistry or something. Um, and, uh, and we take that into account for sure. Other questions? Uh, Cameron. Uh, yeah, on the admissions page, the uh, section for cooperation and conflict sounded really interesting to me. I was just wondering if any of the peer advisors could maybe talk about like specific classes they took related to that concentration or just the like, general feel of it. Terrific. I think Grace is a CNC person, right? Yeah, I'm CNC, so I can talk a bit about that. Um, I obviously love the concentration, um, but in terms of specific classes that I've taken, um, I've been interested mostly in sort of a comparative politics approach. So looking at um, different regions and the way that conflict and cooperation plays out there. So for example, I last year took International Relations of the Middle East with Professor Krauss. Um, which was a fantastic course. I will say that's probably sort of an upper level course um, that I like 
it was difficult, but like a great course. So maybe save that for um, when you're a sophomore or junior. Um, but a lot of courses like that, um, a lot of poli sci and history courses, I'd say, um, are what most of my CNC friends take. Um, there's a few good courses on Latin America um, with Professor Purnell, who is a popular professor. Um, and then a really popular course, which Mary's in as well right now, is um, a sociology course, Peace or War, um, with Professor Derber, um, which satisfies one of the foundation requirements for cooperation and conflict. Um, and I recommend that one for sure. So there's a ton of different options. If you look at the website, you'll see just next semester, there's like 30 to 40 electives that are um, available for CNC. Um, so if you want to talk more about specific courses or ones that I'd recommend, um, feel free to email me or sign up for a session as well. Um, yes, I put a link in the chat there to our list of approved courses uh, that are for spring 2021. So you can see that on, the, on that page, there are tabs on the left when you scroll down a little for our core courses and then for each of the four concentrations and then our senior seminars, and then a focus on uh, some of our new classes and, and summer courses that are offered. So you can get a taste for what the electives look like. Um, we, you know, I think it's always nice to get some foundational courses under your belt so that you, your electives build on the, on the theories and methods that you've learned in those things and the content as well. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we love about being interdisciplinary is that we wanna encourage people to pursue their interests and uh, we'd love to see you do that as well. Do other uh, peer advisors want to recommend any CNC courses that they've liked? Any any particular ones that might cross over? I would emphasize. I, I recognize a lot of the ones that Grace said because um, they mm. do cross over a lot, which is nice. Um, Purnell is wonderful if you're interested in Latin American politics, and um, I think you mentioned Derber's class too. It was definitely an interesting take, very different than my other professors. Um, that I've taken before. Yeah. Right. We have people, you know, faculty who have very different views on the same topic, uh, teaching classes that you uh, that you'll take multiple ones with very different views. And that's exactly what we're about. Um, other questions. Oh, so do you have to go in with like a set concentration or can you switch it like the end of sophomore year? Great question. You can switch whenever you want. You can switch your concentration whenever you want, as long as you can complete that concentration. So there are many courses that count for two or even three sometimes uh, concentrations if they have uh, if they're diversely you know situated. Um, and so it can be quite easy to pivot between concentrations along the way. There's no penalty or anything like that. It's just a matter of whether it can be worked out. Um, so it doesn't, when you're applying into, we don't accept people by a quota system of which concentration they want. We accept people and then we see what they like. Um, and that has no bearing on how we're accepting people. Um, and people are free to, free to move uh, around the concentrations. Yeah, Mario. Uh, kind of similar on that. Um, I'm particularly interested in global cultures, but um, ethics and social justice um, is also pretty uh, interesting to me. So like if there's a class that uh, isn't particular to global or doesn't apply to global cultures, am I still able to take that? Um, or should I just solely be focusing on that sort of concentration and like what fulfills that? Um, so you're asking, uh, there's two things I heard. One is how do you decide between those two and is taking a class that doesn't count for both a bad way to do that? Do you mean, can you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, both those. Well, so uh, one of the things that's important is that uh, although we have a list of these like 380 some classes that, that can be included as electives, our principle is that if you can convince us that it relates to your concentration, then we'll accept it. Uh, Professor Nakazato is the gatekeeper there. So send him flowers before you do, um, but um, um, we, so A is you may take a class and you may say that uh, if, if it's a global cultures class, if it has a substantial, you know, component of ethics as a method or a way of being or a, a social justice as its content, it may be able to count for it anyway, um, and vice versa, depending on what the course is. But if not, I mean, then you're taking a terrific class that you're interested in, and it may not end up counting for your major. And that's perfectly fine too. 
the only times when that becomes complicated is if you try to, you know, double major and double minor and you have all every class needs to fit exactly in one place, um, then they, that becomes more of a struggle. But we, you know, we try to um, discourage the sort of massive lockdown of your classes where every class has to satisfy a requirement for something because you're here at a liberal arts university with an opportunity to follow your follow your interests. And we, you know, we encourage you to take that take that space to do that. And so um, go ahead and take that class and don't fret too much about it. And uh, if it fits, we'll help you make it fit. And if it doesn't, then you will have taken a great class. That's, that's my approach anyway. Um, Jackie. Yeah, so assuming admission into the program, um, I know there's like a couple of classes you have to take sophomore year, but is it possible to still take like Pulse? Because I know that's a big class as well, but I was planning, um, I just don't know if that, if you can still take it sophomore year. Yeah, Professor Nakazato can, can respond uh, to that. We've had a few students who have done Pulse. That's of course two uh, courses, philosophy, theology, philosophy, theology. And then of course on the fall, we have the Where on Earth, which is also another two course six credit course uh, it is doable it's a little it's a little bit of work in the fall in the spring it lightens up because we only have a one um four credit course the intro to ir um, but we have also had students who are doing chinese or arabic and that's actually done 18 credits in the fall because of course chinese and arabic are two a class a practicum you're doing pulse philosophy theology and then we're on earth we do allow it it's just that we have to sort of uh, juggle courses around to make it work um, so I wouldn't want to discourage you from doing Pulse if that's something you want to do. You can certainly fit it into an IS curriculum. Um, that's that's absolutely. I mean, right? Pulse is an amazing program. It's a it's a hallmark of BC. It's a it's really a perfect program for ESJ, you know, ethics and social justice folks in our program. We'll do everything we can to work with the Pulse office to make sure your placements don't overlap with your uh, section discussion groups and things like that. It can be challenging at times, and it might mean that, that you need to do some trade-offs here and there, but we work really hard to make sure that it works. I think that's a good question. John. Um, do you know what the majority of students in the major choose in regards to the language requirement? Do they usually choose like one advanced language and go all the way with that, or do they usually choose two languages and just go the intermediate track for both? It, yeah, Professor Nakazato has the bird's eye view, I think. Yeah, it varies. You might have, say, have taken French in your high school and you just don't want to do any more. And you, then you can then switch to, say, Spanish. Because you've already got one at intermediate, do the other one. Most students, though, figure, I want to get very good at a language. And a lot of them actually end up minoring in it. Because if you're going to go to CCR Spanish, that's third year Spanish, you're starting a, a Spanish minor at that point. Um, so it varies. And again, the rules do allow, and this is maybe unfair advantage. Uh, Mary Sue, for example, speaks fluently in Chinese. She just walks in, completes that requirement. So the, the requirement really affects, you know, most monolingual Americans. Like we have to figure out a language to get good at. And um, I think most students sort of see the utility of getting one to advance, which is third year, only because that, that's better for say post-graduation jobs or what have you. Um, but there are students who said, yeah, I've, I've done French all my high school, don't want it anymore. I want to do Italian. And of course, that's fine. So we'll let what you put one away, start again. And when we have students, um, you know, uh, for example, like Mary, who's a native uh, Mandarin speaker who, who studied Spanish uh, for many years. And, and you, even though you've completed your requirements, you still have well, three, three years of Spanish, at least, right? Plus high school, probably, uh, at least. Um, many more and uh, uh, you know Mariana is a, is a native Spanish speaker as well. We have, we, we have a lot of languages uh, spoken in the program. People satisfy our language requirements with, with Russian and Korean and Turkish and, and um, uh, Arabic and Mandarin and Spanish and French and German and all sorts of things. So, and there's, we try to make it, um, the important thing is that what we're looking for is uh, proficiency at different levels, not that you've taken a particular class or anything like that. We give you lots of options as to how you satisfy the requirement. You can get a high score on your AP exam. You can get a high score on an SA2 exam. You can take a class in that language that demonstrates your capacity to, not, not a language course, but a content course in that language, demonstrates your ability to function in that language quite well. You can simply walk in and take a written and oral exam in one of the language departments here to show us. Um, there's lots of ways. We're not trying to hold hold um, 
make it harder. We're simply uh, setting a high standard for what we expect from our students. And we let you meet that in, in many, many different ways. Does that, does that answer your question, John? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I think it's uh, anecdotally, I don't know what were the peer advisors, uh, do you guys, how do you, how have you and your friends uh, uh, managed the language requirement? Mary, why don't you start for us? Um, I just wanted to add that I feel like a lot of, for a lot of us, language requirement isn't really necessarily a huge burden in terms of requirement wise, because it naturally flows from interest. Um, so for example, I said, I'm really interested in Latin America and the human rights and memorials that went on there, their histories. And so it just naturally flowed that I want to learn Spanish because I want to learn about what's, what was going on in Latin America. And that is why I'm also taking CCR in Spanish and I'm planning on taking advanced Spanish next semester, even though I can already just purely satisfy the language requirement with my Mandarin speaking. So I feel like it just, a lot of the time is it just really follow your interest. And if you just naturally find yourself interested in a part of the world and want to learn about it, it is really likely that you want to learn about their language as well. Yeah, That's well, I, can, really well said. I can just echo that really quickly. Um, like I spoke Spanish growing up, but I'm also now interested in taking French um, because it is the, like a major global language and having interned um, at an international organization, I realized that French was used a lot. So now I'm picking up, I have space in my schedule to also learn French. So it's definitely um, like what you put into it and, and what kind of follows logically with your interests, as Mary said. So students can go ahead and keep asking questions in the chat or raise your hand, but let me ask um, our peer advisors to talk a bit about your study abroad experience, since that's such a big part of our program. Um, uh, Brianna, why don't you start? Um, tell us about your study abroad and any any reflections you have on that for, for freshmen. Perfect. I just want to add something really quick about the language requirement, which ties right in. Um, for me, I did have to take the three years of French, which I'm no good at languages. Um, it's very tedious for me, but I do think it's important. And I'm, I'm considering ways post-grad to be continuing taking French because I know that my regional focus is Africa and I know that I want to work in international organizations and um, the second global, the second language in the UN, if not the first, is the French. So I know this will be important for my future and it will open up a lot of doors. So I'm going to continue learning French, uh, which is why IS has this requirement for reasons like this. But yeah, study abroad was amazing, but it was cut short by the coronavirus, unfortunately, during the semester I went. Um, but it was such an incredible experience to be abroad and take classes in economics and human rights, but from a completely different perspective. Um, we took current, we, I took a current issues class on American politics and UK politics, but from a French perspective. And I found that like really eye opening because there were things that I just completely disagreed with and things that I was like, oh wow, I can't believe that I've never heard of this before. Um, and rarely, I think do I have, or not rarely, but less often do I have those experiences in my courses at BC because we're so in tune and have like the same, we're reading the same newspapers, going off the same events and have the same historical context to like base a lot of our political opinions off of. Um, but yeah, there were other parts of study abroad that I would say opened my eyes to a lot of the things that I touched on in my ethics, religion and international politics class with Professor Owens. For example, in class, we discussed La Cité, um, secularism, um, and religion and that and its role in politics. And I thought that when I was done with that class, that class was over. But then to, when I went abroad to no avail, it was there every day confronting me with the rampant, um, I would say Islamophobia and just general xenophobia and just fear of immigrants um, in the French culture and society right now, which is uh, continues to be a very pertinent issue. And so that was something since I was in a host family, I had to confront on a daily basis at the dinner table um, and I emailed Professor Owens about a month in and said, you know, I'm no good at French. I've been struggling and struggling to like just hold a conversation with my host family. But finally, I have started putting together Quizlets just so that I can defend immigrant rights at dinner, because I think that is so important. Um, and that just goes to show like how much this major is passion um, and how important the subjects that we work with really are. Thanks so much. I think that also speaks, Brianna, to the to the general feeling that a lot of students here have. You you can study something in the classroom, and and no matter how accurately it depicts the world around you, it's when you go abroad and you experience that um, 
the the new ways of thinking, different ways of being, uh, spectacular places or even quiet, uh, solitary places around the world. That these things start to lock in and um, and start, and you come back to Boston College with a new perspective on what you're doing and what you're studying. Uh, that can be really um, that can be really profound. And it's not always a perspective of daisies and flowers and and puppies. It's frequently the kind of experience you had, Brianna, which is challenging and provoking ethically and um, and asking you to summon virtues like courage uh, to talk to people uh, that disagree with you across the table in a different language. It's really uh, a huge growth experience. And we, we love that it's a part of our thing. Um, do the others wanna talk about study abroad too? Yeah, I can talk about my study abroad experience. Um, I actually had two main study abroad experiences. I was really fortunate. Um, the summer after my sophomore year, I did an internship with the State Department in Lima, Peru. So that was sort of my first big study abroad. Um, and it was a lot different from, I think, a normal um, academic one, just because it was a lot more independent um, and sort of figuring out what I was doing. Um, it was a professional environment and kind of similar to Brianna, that was the first time that I really saw academic issues I had studied in school happening in the real world. Um, during that summer, it was sort of right in the midst of the Venezuelan migrant crisis starting to become a really big issue. And I, I would have conversations with my Uber drivers who were Venezuelan and they would tell me about their families who were still stuck in the country. And just seeing that firsthand in the country and then coming back to BC in the fall and then taking classes on Latin America was just a really awesome experience to sort of compare my classroom experience with my experience living there and getting to know people from the country and immigrants there. Um, so that was a really great sort of study abroad experience for me. Um, and I'm really grateful that I did that. And then as well, um, last spring, I studied abroad in Granada, Spain um, before COVID hit too bad, um, obviously. Um, and really similarly, I was there for two months, but just a great, just a great overall experience. I think the best way to perfect or get better at any language skill is to be somewhere fully immersed. That was huge for me. So, you know, living with a host mom or host parents, like Brianna said, and practicing your language skills with them, talking to them about their culture and their history is sort of like something so special and unique that you're really not gonna be able to do unless you're living somewhere with people um, from that specific country. So those are two, my, two of my study abroad experiences and they're both amazing and really special in different ways. Mary, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I was going to talk about because I'm a junior and so my unfortunately semester study abroad is got canceled because of the pandemic right now. But I was fortunate enough to go on a, a study abroad in Chile with Professor uh, McMenamin, um for a philosophy class of my freshman summer. And uh, because I did it so early, I just noticed how important it was to my academic career here at BC um, because I learned so much about human rights. Um, when I was in Chile. And so then coming back from that class, I took um, comparative human rights with Professor Pernell. And then from that class, I was learning about universal declaration of human rights and all the international levels of human rights laws. And that also inspired me to take international law with Professor Nakazato. Um, so I feel like this it really starting with this, the decision for me to study abroad is like a chain of event that is leading me to pursue uh, an interest that I wouldn't have known or even noticed that existing in the world, um, shall I not took that class in Chile and talked with say my host mother and host brother with the issue at hand and see how important and pressing that issue was still to the current Chilean community. And, um, and, and in addition to that as well, I feel like being able to be there and have that international connection um, also is very, just very interesting in general to make more friends. Um, so I could make Chilean food now in my kitchen and I was just making it last week and taking pictures and sending it to my host mom. And um, I think that, that type of connection just internationally is very amazing. Um, I echo everything everyone else said and to not be redundant, I'll just give a quick summary. Um, I went to Geneva, Switzerland last spring. Um, it was amazing. It was, um, I learned a lot about myself as well as international law. 
Um, and I was surrounded by many major international organizations. So I felt really like <laughs> I was basically like inside the international studies program, but like in Switzerland. Um, so that was great. And if people have questions about that, I'm happy to answer. Um, but I echo everyone else's statements and every um, abroad experience is so unique and really what you make it for yourself. Great. Yeah, so we've talked about the admission process a bit. We talked about some of the courses and selections. Um, we talked about study abroad. Uh, we've talked uh, a little less about career stuff, um, but we're, um, we're open to talking about that as well. Um, are there other questions that people want to lift up? Is it possible we answered everyone's questions? Um, if so, um, you know, we, I want to reiterate that our peer advisors are always available for, for a conversation with you. Um, there's a link to peer advising that Mariana posted up early on. Um, and um, you don't need to rush into anything, but, um, you know, toward the end of the semester after Thanksgiving, check out the, um, check out our application. I very strongly encourage you, Mariana, can you put a link to the subscription for our website, for our newsletter? Um, do you have that handy? Um, I encourage you to, uh, I do if you don't, um, I encourage you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, um, which has all of, it sends out all kinds of stuff that's going on in our program, updates about the various projects that I talked to you about, and, um, and also uh, deadlines and things like that that are coming up. Um, Here's the, uh, here it is in the chat there. Um, and um, I also um, uh, look forward to having all of your applications. It's really an exciting community that we're a part of. It's a privilege to teach here as a part of it. I love the students that we have. We really work hard to build a community here. Uh, it's been, um, you know, challenging for us like everyone during COVID. But uh, the, our building, our offices are hosted, are housed in Connolly House, which is uh, this big mansion on Hammond Street, three houses down from Beacon Street. So we're a little off the main, uh, the main center of campus. But what that means is that we have an enormous back lawn and a porch that we have events on. We have a beautiful downstairs area for mid-size events. And we do, we have an office upstairs where you can study and hang out and watch movies and such like that up in our back area. Um, we're a pretty, pretty cool program, I think. And uh, it's because of all the students that are so great. So I hope you'll be a part of our community and we look forward to seeing your applications and uh, uh, keep in touch. Anybody have last, last parting words? I think you summed it up really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much everybody for being here. We'll put a recording of this up. Uh, uh, tell your friends who weren't able to make it. We'll post it on the admission page, I think. Uh, of our website in a few days it takes a little bit to be transcribed. We have to have a transcription of it before it can go online, uh, but uh, we'll get up pretty quickly.